I, uh, a while back, a few years ago actually, when we were living in Memphis, Lindsay had gotten married that summer, and uh, Jan had become a, uh, a uh, wedding planner for people. She would not charge, she would just do it, and it was mainly for friends or people of the congregation, church. So we uh, have this uh, wedding of two young couples. Both of them were a member of the church. We knew the families extremely well. They'd all been in our house. And so they go to the rehearsal, and because I'm just married to her, I get to tag along. So they have the rehearsal dinner. So I'm sitting there in Steve's world, minding Steve's business, and the young couple is sitting up front, and they're having what you normally have at a wedding rehearsal. They're talking about them. There's smiles all over their faces. And uh, the next day, they're going, to be, they're going to be wed. So I'm just sitting there. I've drifted off somewhere. And the mother of the bride, Tina, came to me and said, I want you to make a speech. And uh, what? Now? Now. And so shoves a microphone at me. You give me a microphone? So, but what do you say? I mean, I'm totally unprepared. I, w I wouldn't even end the, mentally, I wouldn't even there. I was somewhere else. But I've known both of these young, this young couple for, for quite a while, just great people. So I stand up, and I turn around, and I look at them collecting thoughts. And this came out of my mouth. I don't know why. I don't know where it come from, but it come out of my mouth. So I looked at them, and I said... One of you spotted the other one and said, I'm going to marry that person. The other person had no clue. Matter of fact, they were dating someone else. Not to give it away, but she said, I'm going to marry that guy. And here we are. You proposed to her. And she accepted. So you think you're in love. You think you, you, think you know what love is and you think you're in love. And you're going to be married tomorrow. And you're going to be standing there in all your finery with everything going on. And you think, this is love. I know what love is. This is love. <clears throat> but is it really? What it really is is the building block for love. We're starting down here. because, quite honestly, do we really know at this age, two young college students, they're in college, do we really know what love is? So... I, asked, I told him, I said, at some point in time, perhaps or maybe not, but at some point in time, you're going to decide to start a family, maybe. And maybe you'll be able to. And so, guys, you're in, believe it or not, in the dark ages, they allowed us to go into the delivery room. I know this was a long time ago, wasn't it? back when they first started. So I've been in the delivery room when, when your wife is giving birth. And there's two things that cross your mind. There's two things and it just... You say two prayers. Number one, thank you, Lord, for making me a man because this looks like it's hurting really, really bad. But more seriously, you thank God for this, this mate you have. She's giving birth. And you'll do that. Now, there's certain things you don't do in the lip. Get the fingernails cut before you go. Hers, not yours. Don't try to hug them after them. They don't want nothing to do with you. Walk away. The guy's job at this point in time is to grab the baby, leave her, run out into the foyer, and you don't know what to This is it. This is all you can do. All you can do is grin. But you have, and you think, wow, this, is, this woman... This is love. I know what love is. So you go about your life. At some point in time, there's going to be something to befall you. Something that's not nice and it's not pleasant. It could be a physical problem for one of you. Or it could be a financial problem for one of you. But I told him, I said, if you approach this through God, through Jesus Christ, 
and abide in God's word, no matter what this problem is, physical or financial, when you come out of this on the other side, you're going to be tighter than you were before you went in. It's the facing of the problems that will give you some strength. When you come through it. So, you're going to go on about your life. And one day you're going to be rocking and you're going to be holding hands and you're going to look back and you're going to see maybe grandchildren, if you're lucky. And you're going to think, this is love. I have come to understand what love is. I know what love is. Look around me. I'm surrounded by it. I've been building on love this whole time. We started way down here and we just added to it. Every experience... Everything we've had to overcome is added to the love. And then one day, you're going to be holding the hand of your mate, and the eye, the uh, light in her eye is going to be flickering, and it's going to go out. <clears throat> it was prophetic. I had no idea. But now you realize what love is. Love, you you, you kept thinking you were at the apex of your relationship, and you weren't. You were adding to it every day. You could never get there because every day the love was more. The love was stronger. You were adding to it. Every day. You could never get to the top until this happens. Now you realize it's an amalgamation of everything that's ever happened that constitutes what our love is and how our love has grown. And what have you got at the end? What have you got? You have your love story. It's yours. It's nobody else's. You can't translate it to someone else. You can't give it to them as a gift. It's yours. You can't really define it. You try to talk about it. But this is your love story. It's not anybody else's. You have your love story. And it's precious to you. But your love story is not the love story. Your love story is about you. The love story is about all of us. Your love story is confined within your certain time period. The love story was thought of before your love story ever began. The love story was before the foundation of the of the universe. The love story is greater than your love story. The love story started here and it's never wavered. The love story was free to you. So let's begin. Let's begin our topic. What Jesus said about love. Our seed verse was Matthew 22 and 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. <clears throat> You've all read it. You're reading it right now, as a matter of fact. What does it mean? When you read verses, what do they mean? I just pound this into my classes. You've got to read it. Then you've got to go back and read it. Then you've got to go back and read it again. You've got to read it and read it and read it to understand it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's not a suggestion, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the entire being. That is your entire essence of who you are, physically, mentally, and spiritually. It is an all-consuming love you have for God. This is what Jesus Christ is talking about. It's all-consuming. It will eat you up. It is supposed to. It's supposed to be in your thoughts. God is supposed to be in your thought process, everything you do. You know, we, 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 we made fun of it probably when it happened. Maybe. Maybe we didn't. 
but the, the bands, what would Jesus... That's right. You really need to think about that. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all the time. It's complete. We had, Jerry and I was on a hike back in May. i got to tell this. Because this is the first time I've used an overhead here. I use them at work all the time, but... But uh, this is so much more important because it's so much, and I, I hate being distracted by having to do other things. So Jerry and I are on this hike, and, and, and look, let me tell you, about lost two old men. We almost tackled more than we could handle, <laughs> but we finally get to where we're at. And we have these wonderful talks, and um, we get us at the top, and we're talking about overheads. And Jerry said, I like them. I said, I don't. He said, well, I like, I like to see the scriptures. And I said, That's, I don't like that. He said, well, I like to see the translation that the presenter is using, and that way I can follow him and his translation, the difference between his translation and my translation. I said, well, I don't like it. I don't like it because I think it makes us lazy. I mean, I think you ought to have to know where the books of the Bible are. You've got to flip. You've got to hear pages cracking. You've got to look. You've got to dig. You've got to go after it. And Jerry... <laughs> Jerry looks over at me and says, do you realize that 33% of the people in the audience have electronic Bibles? We have an overhead with verses on them today. Although I did leave some of them off just for old time's sake. So, let's talk about love in the New Testament. We've talked, you know, we're going to go over this because you have to. We, we, we just have to. There's four definitions in the Greek language for love. Eros is not in the New Testament. Eros is where we get the word erotic from, right? So what is erotic? What is eros? Eros is an all cons- I see it, I want it, I consume it, I'm done with it. It's done. It's something you desire, you want, you get, or you conquer, and you're done with it. That's eros. doesn't fit in the New Testament. Storge, family love, family love. Family love. Storge is like uh, your uh, Uncle John. Fill in the name. It's like your uncle. And, uh, you know, he's got more hair in his ear than he does on his head. He uh, wears clothes that are embarrassing. He says things that are embarrassing to you. First time you brought your boyfriend or girlfriend by, he just embarrassed you. And just... But you know what? You love your uncle because he's family. It's not an erotic, it's not an eros love, so that doesn't fit. But because he's family, you love him. And then we have phila, which is a friendship love. Now this is important. Friendship love. I have a good friend, let's say. Let's define it this way. I have a good friend, and because you're my good friend, you move 30 times in a year, I'm there for you. I'm going to help you move. I'm going to come in and I'm going to pick up your stuff and I'm going to, you know, risk injury to myself, but I'm going to help you move. But I move two or three times and you don't show up. The friendship may be over. See, Fila requires me to expect something in return from you. If I show you some love, then I expect you to show me some love back. That's Fila. That's, that's your friendship. And then agape, which we're mainly concerning ourselves with today. Agape. It's a desire to do what's best for another. Does it depend on the return of affection from another person to exist? I don't expect anything from you when I show you this kind of love. Nothing. There's no lines, there's no tags to it. This is the love that Jesus showed us. This is the love that God showed us. And this is the love that's repeatedly commanded for us to observe. And we're going to spend probably, all, probably everything we do. I think just about everything we do today is going to be agape. Just about. Not everything. But just about everything we're going to do is going to be agape. So there you have it. I don't know if you've ever counted how many times love is talked about in just in the New Testament. And I didn't count them up. I printed them off. I've got a, just a book of it. All of them, All the loves. It's a bunch. John by himself in his writings 
had a chapter. But it is a bunch of reference to love. And I think the vast majority of it is talking about agape. Love is the foundation. Love as the foundation. The foundation of what? The foundation of why you're here. It all revolves around love. You're told to love God because He loves you. Not because He loves you. Love God. He loves you. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> it's an agape love. He gave His Son with no expectation of anything in return. He just put it out there. Love God. He loves you. Speaking of which, if you really do love God, and think about this because we're going to answer this, but if you really do love God, what are you going to do? I mean, real love involves the question, what? It's the nature of God. 1 John 4, 8 through 10, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. For the one who does not love does not know God. Now this <clears throat> is not segmented into a classification that if you don't love because uh, somebody's done you wrong, somebody's hurt your feelings. No, you're not given up. You're not written a pass. It says if you do not love, you do not know God. Now we need to look a little bit further about love, which we're going to do. And we're going to look a little bit more into love, but... If you don't love, you don't know God. Now think about that. We're going to get into the subject of what love is. But if you don't love, you don't know God. And there's plenty of people out there who think they love God, but they don't love. And God will love us. So this will... John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode in him. God will love us. Now, is that different from love God, he loves you? Yes, it is. You lo lo God loves you with no expectation in return. It's agape. When it says God will love us and God will, dwell, if, if, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, number one, conditional. If, if you love me, then you will do this. You will keep my word. If you love me, you will keep my word. Okay, so that's set. And the result of you keeping my word is that my Father will love you, him or you, and will come to him and make our abode with him. How? How is it that the Father and the Son are going to come and make their abode in you if you love God and you keep his commandments? How is it that they are going to be inside of you they're going to make their abode. They're going to dwell within you. How is it that that happens? It's through His Word, right? Through God's Word, God's law, God's commandments, what God wills for us should live in you. You can find it all right here. And in here, if that's where God and Jesus are abiding in us, is the commandments to do what? To love. So, how can I not love and say, I love God. It's impossible. And how can I not love and expect God to love me? It's impossible. You're told it's not going to happen. But if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Certainly the greatest of all Christian virtues, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now, <clears throat> faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is agape. The greatest of these is love. Now abide with faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. We'll see why that's the greatest virtue. Well, we also have the example. We have the command, and we'll get into more commands, but we'll ha we have the command to love. We have the... Uh, Instruction that if we don't love, we don't know God. We're told that if we have God's, if we obey uh, the commandments of Jesus, that the Father and the Son will abide in us. What about Jesus as the example? Here's our lesson. 
what Jesus said about love. Jesus loved God. And he wanted the world to know. John 14, 31. Think about it. Listen to this. But the, that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. I love this passage. It teaches me a whole lot about what I do and what I don't do correctly. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. So here's, here's the lesson of this verse. Does the world know that you love God? Jesus said, so that the world does know that I love God, I will, as He has given me commandment, I'm going to carry them out. I'm going to do them. So the lesson to us is what? How many people know that you love God? How many people know you attend this congregation? How many people know your beliefs about anything? And we've been on this a lot here lately. I think it was brought up in the lecture series by someone. We used to use, and I was the world's worst, we used to use, it's not the right time, it's not the right place. Wrong. It's always the right time. And the place is irrelevant. The time to talk about Jesus Christ is when it's brought up before you. I've run from those situations before. That's shameful. And I know some of you have too. That is a, that's shameful on us. We should want the world to know that you love God. And because you love God, you're going to keep His commandments. Jesus loved us. Oh, here's one I forgot to do. Jerry, uh, if you will, turn with me to 1 John. The other thing is, don't ever go preach a lesson with a brand new Bible. You can't. The pages are in the wrong place. I don't, I'm not even sure the Bible, the verses, the books are lined up right. 1 John chapter 3. Jesus loved us. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And I heard 66% of you turn in your Bible. We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and see his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Who better... Are you to learn love from than Jesus Christ? Who? There is, there is no. It's the greatest example there is. You see, it, Christ died for you. you. You already know that. Christ died for you. You're gonna. We're gonna partake of the Lord's Supper, and I really make an effort to uh, zone out uh, everything. I make an effort to get up on Sunday morning. Thanking God for this day, thinking about the Lord's Supper, thinking about what it entails and what it represents. I think it's really, really important that we're, when we're observing the Lord's Supper, that we give the respect and the concentration that it's, that it's due. So I concentrate about, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So I try to do that. I, I try, uh, so, I try. Sometimes I, you know, I, I have failed and mind has wandered, but I try to focus on Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what Jesus looked like, so I, I can't picture his body. So I've kind of got just a blank form there, but it's from head to toe, fingertip to fingertip, as his arms are stretched out on the cross, represented by the bread. Got that? The body of Christ is represented by the bread. The fruit of the vine represents the blood that he shed for the remission of sins. Him being the perfect sacrifice in body without blemish, his blood replaces everything else and is the perfect sacrifice for us so that you and I have an advocate with the Father and we have access to heaven. Our path is through Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you. The other day, uh, a while back, we were observing the Lord's Supper, and it dawned on me 
while I'm concentrating on this, and I'm really trying to focus, it suddenly, I don't know, everybody else talks about it, it just went off in my head. Jesus died for everybody. It wasn't just me. This was the agape love. Jesus Christ died for the half of the, the more than half of the population from the crucifixion to this day right now. The majority of people do not recognize Him as the Savior. They do not recognize Him as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They do, he died for them. Some of them will recognize Him as a prophet. Some religions. Some will recognize him as a man, as a historical figure. Some people won't recognize him at all. And yet he died for them just like he did for me. So that because God desires all men to be saved, they have it if they come across it. He died for people that will never recognize him as the Son of God. That's love. I mean, that's, that's truly, truly, that's love. There's the commands. Love one another. John 15, 12, and 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. All right. Uh, verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. Go back to 15, uh, 12, 12 there. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So what does it mean? You're, you're, the command is, is you're to love each other as I have loved you. And now, how did Jesus love you? I'm to love you the way Jesus loves me. Jesus gave his life for me. I'm to love you without expecting anything in return for the love that I'm going to show you. That's agape. I'm going to love you without anything coming back, expecting anything to come back to me. Command, these I command you, that you love one another. So you're sitting on this side, and you're sitting on that side, and you, you look back and forth, and you look across, and, and um, you cannot have you cannot have, you just simply cannot. It is a sin to sit there and say, I don't like that person. You just, you can't, you just can't do it. It's a violation. I know things go through our heads, but when we're, you can't do that to a brother. You just can't do it. The commandment is, is that you love, not that you Scornfully think about it. Well, another command. Uh, and, and the same thing in 1 John 3, 13 through and 23. We're not going to read those. But the same thing about loving your brother and showing your brother love and going out of your way to show your brother love. That's agape. I don't expect anything. I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to do something for you as my brother, and I expect you to do... No, it's not it whatsoever. Love your neighbors. Matthew 19, 19, you shall love your neighbors as yourself. Second of the commandments. Why? Why would you love your neighbor as yourself? Now, how, how do you love yourself? Most of us are in love with ourselves, right? Most of us are pretty much infatuated with ourselves. We love, we love us. We love some of us. So why would you love your neighbor as you love yourself? What, what's in it? It's not in it for you. It's agape. This is agape. It's not in it for you. Why would you love your neighbor as yourself? Well, since you're so in love with yourself, and you're infatuated with yourself, would you ever hold anything back to yourself that would deprive you of a great reward? Would you ever do that to yourself? No. So why would you not share with your neighbor Jesus Christ? Why would you not share with your neighbor what Jesus means to you? And how 
uh, you're trying your best to live the life that Jesus has given to you. Let me tell you, if your neighbor had it and you found out about it and he didn't share it with you, you would be highly upset. Does it matter what the response is going to be? The command is love your neighbor as yourself. It's a command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Boy, this, this is difficult. Uh, this, this is really difficult. Love your enemies. This is a struggle. And yet it's a command. Love your enemies. This, this is really, I might can say, uh, yes, of same mind, I'm going to love my brother. We're all working for the same go. I see, I see that I should share with other people. That would be my neighbor, whoever my neighbor is. And my neighbor may be somebody at work. It's not just the person that lives with you. It's whoever you're in contact with. That's your neighbor. Which means, as we regress, which means that as you go about in the world, whoever you're rubbing elbows with during the day, that's your neighbor. Okay? But here I am, I've got to love somebody who's my enemy. But I say to you who here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Think about uh, how hard that is. That's just, that goes against your, the grain of you being a human being. We have spent generation after generation, after generation, culture, after culture, after culture, fighting. Trying to kill each other. Sometimes it's in the name of uh, religion. Well, matter of fact, a whole bunch of wars. Most wars, it seems like, starts for religion. Most of them always involve greed of some kind. Most all of them always involve something somebody else has that you want, whether it be possessions or whether it be land. Now, <clears throat> you're told 2,000 years ago, while this certainly was going on uh, with the Romans as they expanded their empire, you're told to love your enemies. And if you're a Christian, remember, we, we get all wrapped up into what we're talking about this today, today, today. Remember who this was written to. This was written 2,000 years ago. What's going on 2,000 years ago? And how does it relate to me? All of it relates to you, because these things never change over the course of time. They, they, they continue to repeat themselves. History does repeat itself. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ said, love your enemies. Who's your enemy? He's talking to the Jewish nation. Who's your enemy? It's the Romans. You're elbow to elbow with these enemies. And you're supposed to love them. Remember, pray for them. Bless them. Even if they spitefully use you, which the Romans would do to whomever they've conquered, you're to love your enemy. If you have not had this happen to you, some of you are young in your career, this will happen to you because you're young in your career. Those that are older in their career have seen this. If you're out in the workforce, there's that guy or girl in your workplace who will step all over you to get ahead of you. They will use your material. They will talk bad about you. They will promote themselves. They will do whatever's possible for them to be over you. You've got to love that person. That's right. You've got to love that person. As the Romans were throwing the Christians into a, any of the Colosseums, the the big one in Rome, that's the Colosseum. But there were other places that they would torture and kill the Christians. It wasn't just in Rome. They would go out and they would take families as entirety and they would put them in the middle of the arena and they would not feed the wild animals for a while and they'd douse them in blood and then they'd turn the wild animals loose and they let them just tear them apart. You're to love that person. If you had... If you were captured by ISIS and they had a knife to your throat, you're to love that person. You think about that. Would your prayer be for God to forgive that person as they're about to kill you? But you're told to do that. What I think I failed to realize is 
is if you love your enemies, it makes loving the brethren a whole lot easier. Right? It makes loving those who have the same mind a whole lot easier if I can love those who's trying to, in essence, kill me. To love Jesus is to be obedient. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home. Very much similar to what we read as our opening passage. Again, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my word. I mean, I just, I love, John. John's writings are for simpletons like me. John is so clear. And it's just, you can read it and you really don't have to discuss it. What could I tell you about this passage? How do we expand on this? This is so easy. If you love me, you will keep my word. It, that's as simple as it gets. If you love me, you will keep my word. And this word will give us answer to everything, including how we're supposed to love our enemies, by the way. My father will love him and we will come to him and make home with him. John 15, 9 and 10, As the father loved me, I also have loved you. And remember, as the father loved Jesus, Jesus has loved them. Remember what he said earlier? You're to love the brethren as I have loved you. So the love that you're showing to the brethren is the same love that the Father has shown to Jesus Christ. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. As the Father loved me, I have loved you. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. And then John 14 to 5, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, you know, I don't, there's nothing to say. That's as simple as it gets. Then there's teachings on acts of love that may not use the form of the, or the word agape. Some of this does, but some of it doesn't. But the, the impression then is that uh, there's love involved in these actions. Do unto others as you want men to do to you, you do unto others, also unto others. But you know what? That makes sense, but it also makes sense that that really is a correlation to loving your neighbor, right? Because you're going to treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself. I want other people to treat me as I treat them. If I'm going to treat them that I love them and I want to share with them, that's how I want them to treat me. You can't love God in money. We've covered that earlier in one of the lessons. You just cannot serve. There's nothing wrong with money. It's in, It's... It's an inanimate object. It's, it's a piece, in our case, it's a piece of paper and, and some coin. There's nothing wrong with money. Go out and get a job. Go out and get a good job if you want to. Whether it involves an educa further education or not, go out and get a job. Make money. Don't worship the money that you make. That's not what you're supposed to do. There's nothing wrong with you making money, but don't miss church services to go make money. Don't have your kids miss church services because you're making money. Or your family, and that, that, that can happen. Don't worship the money. It's not the money itself It's bad. How about this for an idea? You go out and you get a good education, you get a good job, and you're making money. Well, you can give money to the congregation. You know what else you can do? You can write an anonymous check and send it to Belize. Or Ireland. Or Africa. Or Rome, Italy. Or Vietnam. You can support... The Word of God, you, it's, it's not just the money, it's the possession of things that you need the money for. So you, you worship the money because you worship the things that money will buy. How about, how, about, how about taking that and giving it back? God's blessed you. You want to help further the Word of, of God beyond the scope of your own neighborhood? Then give the money to where it's going to do some good. There's places in Mississippi... Montgomery, New York, you could send money to those folks. They could use your help. You could go over to Africa. You could buy Bibles. You don't even have to put your name on it. Buy Bibles. There's an address that somebody will have, and you could send those people Bibles with that money that you're making. You're not worshiping the money. You're using the gift that God has given you 
whether it's the education or the trade that you have, you're using it for the furtherance of the gospel. That's not worshiping the money. That's using the gift you've been given. Okay, the Good Samaritan, okay, we're not going to hammer on this, but whose two diametrically opposed thought processes, the Jews think they're dogs, the Samaritans don't want nothing to do with the Jews. So the two Jewish people going down the road bypass the Jew that was beat up. The Samaritan comes by, shows mercy, compassion. Not only does he take care of him, he gives him enough money to take care of him. And when he comes back, he says, I'll, I'll give you what you spend. That's, that's a show of love. Compassion on others, Mark in chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus looked out over the crowd, they'd been following him and his teachings. They hadn't had anything to eat. He took the fishes and the loaves, but he told the apostles, I can't send them home. They'll pass out. They've been sitting here listening. I've got to feed them. It's compassion. Love is an emotion. Lazarus' death. Jesus wept. Right? Lazarus' death. Now, I don't know why he wept. My own personal thought is he wept because... He knew that when he brought Lazarus back, Lazarus was gone. Lazarus has done what time on this earth he had done. And Lazarus had seen the other side. He's four days old. As, as the sister said, he's stinking by now. Jesus brings, I don't know why Jesus, but he's going to bring him back. He knows he's going to be a target. Lazarus is going to have a hard time. Jesus loved him. There's no doubt about that. And maybe his, maybe his love was for this. But he wept. Love is emotion. You can be emotional. What does it look like? Ephesians, you can go to the, just one of the places. One cord, one mind, one thought, one belief, one baptism. Anywhere I want to go, I can talk about what love looks like, how brethren help brethren, how Philippians gave money to, to uh, reaching the, uh, the poor, giving money to those that were uh, in worse shape than them. There's always somebody worse. Love for those who are over us. We're supposed to love the elders. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Let me tell you, this is not on here. Paul wrote, writes this letter to uh, Philemon and says, basically, you need to forgive Onesimus for running off. And if you can't, then put me in his place. Colossians chapter 3, uh, around verse 15, if a brother... If a brother uh, has done something to you, you are to forgive him. It's a command. Forgive. Forgive. Even as Christ forgave you. There's, there's the hook. You're to forgive because Christ forgave you. Also in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, that same thought. Forgive because Christ forgave you. We're affectionate to one another. We're tender-hearted and we're courteous. We love indeed in tr truth. We walk in love. And this is imitate God. Chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 1, imitate God and then serve one another. Here's our conclusion. God loves us. It is His nature to love. And God loves you. Jesus loves God. And Jesus loves us. You and I are to love one another we're to love our neighbors, and we're to love our enemies. As certainly we're to love one another as Jesus loved us. We're to love one another. And we're to be obedient to the commandments of God, to the commandments of Jesus. We are to be obedient, and you and I are to walk in love. That's the conclusion of the lecture series, and I've enjoyed it and appreciate it more than than anybody will ever know. And I'm certainly thankful for the elders to give me this opportunity to stand up before you today and deliver this on this lesson that deserves more study from you. Not, this, not me, but you need to study love more. And fully embrace and encompass what love is. Thank you for your attention.